A very warm good morning to everyone. Dr. Shashi Tharoor once tweeted, education isn't just exams. It is what is left behind in the minds of students when they have forgotten what they learned for the exams. Today is indeed a very special and memorable day for Morningstar Home Science College by the exhilarating presence of one of the unique, dignified and top-notch thinkers of India, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, MP. Morningstar Home Science College has completed 55 successful years of service in the field of women's education. On this occasion, we have planned to provide our students with a number of programs aiming their overall development in the context of our Emerald Jubilee. We hope that today's talk on higher education in India, prospects and possibilities will be highly beneficial to the student community who have gathered here. Let's begin the program by seeking the blessings of the Supreme Power. I invite Ms. Maria Isaac for the prayer song. Jagadishwarani Devame Hridayani Vasagani Mahitan Udayavani Parani Pranamikyum Ninpadam Jagadishwarani Now, I would like to invite Ms. Sophia James, Assistant Professor in English and IQAC Joint Coordinator for the welcome speech. A warm good morning to all. Honorable guest of the day, Dr. Shashi Tharoor MP, respected principal and everyone present here. Morningstar Home Science College was born 55 years ago with a far-sighted vision to educate and empower the women in and around Angamali. Established by the Sisters of Nasrath in 1968, in a humble way, the college has been scaling heights in its journey of 55 years. Today, with one PhD, five PG, eight UG and 18 certificate courses, the college is a shining star in the field of education and social service. This is our Emerald Jubilee year and the time to relish the success story of 55 years. This marvelous occasion is embellished with the presence of a luminary who shines like Emerald in the political and socio-cultural milieu of India. Dr. Shashi Tharoor. 
Dr. Shashi Tharoor is a man who needs no introduction, a scholar par excellence, with a deep understanding of Indian history and world affairs, a narrator and a man of letters. The number of books and articles Dr. Tharoor has penned is so vast that listing them would be a Herculean task. But I can vouch for the fact that even those who haven't gone through any of these works considers Dr. Shashi Tharoor as a synonym for stylish English. It is only because of Dr. Shashi Tharoor that Indians became familiar with words like floxy, nosy, nihili, pilification, and recalcitration, etc. In a dream to grab exuberant English, the common Indian is doing practice in tongue twisting words like these. Before embarking into Indian politics, Dr. Tharoor had a had a momentous stint as Under Secretary General in the United Nations. As a civil servant, diplomat, and a bureaucrat, he brings in a huge volume of exposure into his public service. When a large number of Indians are moving away from India in search of better pastures, here is a person who, in spite of his wide experience in and outside India, decided to come back and to render his service here in India. And India is still to fully reap the fruits of this homecoming. Yet, the enlightened population of Kerala still cherish this hope that Dr. Tharoor's erudition and his integral quality can bring about a paradigm shift to effect a renaissance in all fears. Dr. Shashi Tharoor is here today for a talk on higher education in India, prospects and possibilities, which will be followed by a fruitful interaction with our students. On behalf of Morningstar Home Science College, I extend to you, sir, a most cordial welcome. Let me extend a word of uh, a heartful welcome to our principal, Dr. Sister Rosalie Avi. <laughs> Sri Jason Panikulangara, the man behind today's program, is present here with us. Dear sir, Morningstar College extends it to you a most cordial welcome. <laughs> On this occasion, we are happy to welcome our PTA Vice President, Advocate P.J. George. Welcome, sir. With great pleasure, I welcome all the well-wishers, the media persons, teachers, non-teaching staff, and students to this program. In this jubilee year, Morningstar has taken the initiative to launch a women-led empowerment program titled Let's Fly, a Drive to Excel. This project envisages to provide our students with multifaceted avenues that will enable them to fly high in all walks of life. We are privileged that this project is getting inaugurated by Dr. Shashi Tharoor today. I hope and wish that this program turns out to be a very productive and useful one for all the participants here. Thank you. Now, I would like to call upon our principal, Reverend Dr. Sister Rosalie Avi, to speak a few words on this occasion. In the Namade Vishishta Didi, Dr. Shashi Tedur, Morning Star in the Velvisharam, Naluru Paristidi Pravartaganamaya, Mr. Jason Pinekulangara, PTA Vice President, Advocate PJ George, Sadasilola Vishishta Vectigale, Priya Petta Staff Fangangale, Vithyar Thinigale, Morning Star Home Saints College, Emerald Jubilee Naravilana, Angamarile, Yudia Nakshatram, Ambatanjavarshate Prayanam Purthia Kikondirikinu. Academic Rangatum, Kala Kaiger Rangatum, Samuke Seven Rangatum, Prabhavaritunai Kalalayam, 
ഇനിയും കൂടുതൽ ആവേശത്തോടെ മുന്നോട്ട് കുതിക്കുവാൻ ഒരുങ്ങുന്നു ലെറ്റ്സ് ഫ്ലൈ എ ഡ്രൈവ് ടു എക്സെൽ എന്ന പ്രൊജക്റ്റിന് ഇന്നിവിടെ തുടക്കം കുറയ്ക്കുകയാണ് ഈ പ്രൊജക്റ്റിൽ വിവിധങ്ങളായ പദ്ധതികളാണ് വിഭാവനം ചെയ്യുന്നത് സ്ത്രീ ശാക്തീകരണം ലക്ഷ്യം വെച്ചുകൊണ്ടുള്ള സർട്ടിഫിക്കറ്റ് കോഴ്സുകൾ ഗവേഷണത്തിനുള്ള പ്ലാറ്റ്ഫോമുകൾ ഈഡുറ്റ പ്രഭാഷണങ്ങൾ സ്കിൽ ട്രെയിനിങ് പ്രോഗ്രാമുകൾ എന്നിവയെല്ലാം ഇതിൽ ഉൾപ്പെടുന്നു ഇന്ത്യയിലും വിദേശത്തും നിറസാന്നിധ്യമായി യുവജനങ്ങൾക്ക് ഒരു പ്രേരക ശക്തിയായി നിലകൊള്ളുന്ന ഡോക്ടർ ശശി തരൂരിനെ ഇതിൻ്റെ ഉദ്ഘാടനത്തിനായി ലഭിച്ചതിൽ ഏറെ സന്തോഷമുണ്ട് വളരെ സ്നേഹത്തോടെ ആദരവോടെ സാറിനെ ഇതിൻ്റെ ഉദ്ഘാടന കർമ്മത്തിലേക്കായി ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു താങ്ക് യു Thank you, sir, for doing the honor. Now, the much-awaited moment has arrived. With utmost respect and pride, I welcome Dr. Shashi Tharoor for the lecture. Respected principal, Sister Rosalie. We are all here with you. We are all here with you, Mr. Sophie James. ഇവിടെ ഇരിക്കുന്ന ജേസൺ പാനിക്കുലങ്കര അഡ്വക്കേറ്റ് പി ജെ ജോർജ് ഓൾ ദ സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് ടീച്ചേഴ്സ് ഫാക്കൾട്ടി ഫ്രണ്ട്സ് എല്ലാവർക്കും എൻ്റെ വിനീതമായ നമസ്കാരം യു നോ ഐ സെയിങ് ടു സിസ്റ്റർ റോസിലി വൺ ഐ കേം ഡു റിയലി വോണ്ട് എൻ അതർ ലെക്ചർ ദ പുവർ സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് ആർ ഗെറ്റിംഗ് ലെക്ചേഴ്സ് ഓൾ ദ ടൈം ഇൻ ദ ക്ലാസ് റൂംസ് wouldn't it be more interesting to have an interaction instead where you tell me what's on your mind you raise questions english lo malayalathilo ningal ishta prakaram ningal chodikku ningal oru abhiprayam parayu njan adinu marubadi parayam that would be a far more useful and interesting use of our time pakshe while you are thinking about your questions ivaru thanna topic higher education de sadhyatha kare kurichu i'll say a few words for a few minutes and then you the floor is over to you to ask me questions or to give me your comments on what i have said now when we look at the challenges of higher education in india and we look at the particular challenges of higher education in kerala there are a couple of things that come immediately to mind overall in india i have had the view for some time even when i was minister for one year and a bit for education i genuinely worried that our educational system was over regulated and under governed what is over regulated mean it means that we have a ugc sitting in delhi that gives instructions to all the universities and colleges limiting them as to what has to be in their syllabus telling them how many classrooms they must have what should be the size of the classrooms how many teachers in what subjects how long the degree program should be in other words stifling the originality that any university or college 
would normally be proud to have in any other country. And instead of that kind of over-regulation, where quality and learning output are not emphasized, instead the focus is on quantitative numbers, such as how many square feet in a classroom, how many acres in a campus, all of these questions. I believe that our education system should focus on governance. That is, on improving learning outcomes, on judging colleges and universities by how their students do when they graduate, not just how they fare in exams, which is important, but also what they do in life, how they get placed, what sort of opportunities await them. I'll tell you a couple of simple examples that illustrate the problem we are facing. Within the Congress party, I run an outfit called the All India Professionals Congress, AIPC. And the AIPC's Kerala chapter did a survey of engineering graduates. They asked several thousand engineering graduates about their experience in life after graduating. And they found that 66% of the engineering graduates had found themselves doing jobs that did not require an engineering degree. So what does that mean? It means their education was a waste, either because they were not interested in engineering and they only went to make their parents happy, or because what they were taught was not relevant to the real world occupied by real companies in the, edu in the, in the public industry, and they had no use for what these children had learned in their colleges, the skills they wanted, on the other hand, were not being taught in the engineering colleges. And of course, there is also the final possibility that we are producing too many engineers. India produces five lakh engineers a year. Do we have an industrial capacity to absorb so many? Probably not. And these are amongst the questions that come up in mind when we look at the educational challenges facing us. You may remember that last year we had a, assembly elections in Kerala, Niyama Sabha Teranyarupa. And at that time I was put in charge of the manifesto preparations for the UDF. So I went and talked to a lot of people and one of my recommendations, which is there in the UDF manifesto, was that we should have a higher education reforms commission to study the real challenges and problems faced by the students, they get the opinions of faculty, teachers, administrators, and then make recommendations for change so that our university degrees can be more relevant to the real world. Well, I tried that, but we didn't win the election, so we never got to implement it. But interestingly enough, the LDF, which did not recommend such a thing, they took our idea, they took my idea, and they did announce a Higher Education Reforms Commission, and that commission has submitted a report last month. I haven't read it yet, it's 151 pages long, but I'm planning to do so, and in my own view, it's going to be a very important document for all of us to study how we can improve education. But one of the key questions, as I said, is how do we equip students for the real world of employment, of jobs. Kerala women have no inhibitions about doing work. They have no problems about going to work outside the home, by and large. I know that in some families it's still a problem. But if there is no suitable job, they won't go. And when I look at all you bright young girls, I am struck by two things. The first one is that whenever I go and do university convocations, which is an awful lot, Ever since I came back to India in 2008-9, I have been invited to give away diplomas and prizes and degrees in very many colleges. And every time I do that, I notice that even in colleges which are majority male, the majority of the prize winners are female. All of you know that you take your studies seriously, you do well in your preparations, you're conscientious, 
you are less easily distracted perhaps than the boys and you write your exams well and so girls are doing very well in all the Indian colleges in every subject I have done convocations for liberal arts colleges for medical colleges engineering colleges dental colleges even an Ayurveda college and in every case the pattern is clear four out of five who topped the university three out of five of all the prize winners of the honorable mention the distinctions the first class meritorious students are always girls so congratulations because it's going to be your country but the second thing that strikes me when I see you all is how sad it is that in India today we have the world's lowest female labor force participation rate it was already low before the COVID pandemic but after the COVID pandemic it is now amongst the lowest in the world amongst the major countries the countries who are ranked we have a very high labor force participation rate and that is I mean sorry we have a very low rate of women in the labor force by a very high male rate of participation in the labor force so after COVID women have dropped out of the workforce and have chosen not to go back to work add to this some of the cultural challenges some employers are unwilling are reluctant to recruit women because they fear they will lose their services for many months of maternity leave and so on and therefore women are already facing a challenge in the workplace and then when something like COVID comes along initially they think oh we can work from home but when the work from home home opportunities end many of them say we don't want to go back to the office or to the workplace that has become a big challenge too and this is why I think it's very important that we have progressive legislation that will make it easier for not just women to work but for employers to hire women I'll give you one example everyone talks about having maternity child health care daycare centers and big companies so they can bring their babies to the office and leave them in the care of a full-time employee on the premises so when they go back home at the end of the day they can take their babies with them great idea big companies can do that but small companies usually will not have the space or the facilities for that so they will be reluctant to hire a woman of childbearing age one other problem that is perhaps special to India is that in India maternity leave expenses are always the responsibility of the employer whereas in many other developed countries many other advanced democracies you find that maternity leave costs are shared by the government with the employer so that if indeed you want to pay full salary for three months and half salary for three months more and so on to a new mother to do that the government will give the company half the expense and there will be tax benefits to encourage this I believe India should do that and I propose to bring a bill into Parliament that will make that possible one more thing that we should say and then I'll take your questions you are all entering a world of very rapid change you know there was an Oxford Martin school study which said that 30% of the jobs in the world in 2030 will be jobs that do not exist today think about that for a minute almost one third of the jobs in the world that will be available to you in 10 years in eight years time will be jobs that don't exist today what does that mean how do you prepare for a job that no one can teach you about because the job hasn't been dreamt of yet it is going to be created because of the rapid speed of innovation and technology well the answer and I say this to the teachers who are assembled here and I've been saying it to many teachers but I hope more are listening to me don't teach the children what to think teach the children how to think because what to think is less and less relevant in this world of dizzying rapid change what you can teach them in a textbook printed this year may be out of date by next year so the children have to understand facts will change but your approach to them how you face unfamiliar facts how you deal with problems you've not encountered before 
That is going to be the key to your success, not what to think, but how to think. The days when education was about stuffing your head with facts, creating in children well-formed minds, well-filled minds, that was not the solution. What we need indeed is well-formed minds, minds which may not be filled full of facts because you can get any fact you want with two clicks of a mouse on Google. But what you need is a well-formed mind that can respond to and understand the issues and problems that the real world confronts. Yen eppadum parayum parikshil ki vendi nannai padichollu nalla mark kittikolu. Pakshe college vitta shesham jeevitham nu parna valiya oru pariksha undu. Aa pariksha chodikkana chodigal ella textbook la adinde uttaram kittilla. Parikshayil ningalku adine kuriche adinu vendi thayaravan saichundavilla. So be prepared. Be prepared not just to answer questions in the exam but to be prepared to answer the questions that life will pose you in the years ahead <clears throat> that is my simple message to all of you <coughs> teachers as well as students prepare the children as to how to think and i'm sure that they will be successes in life thank you very much sister rosalie and i'll be very happy to take your questions happy to take your questions or comments that i'll be able to respond to for the next 15 20 minutes the floor is yours oh there is a mic as well excellent come tell me who you are what you're studying which year you're in and then we will respond yeah good morning sir i am leona rose joseph second year bcom you're the head girl of the school i'm in the school yes, captain sir. right yes i met so you. my question is that ഒരു തിളങ്ങി വരുന്ന സ്റ്റാർ ആയ താങ്കൾ ഞങ്ങളുടെ മോർണിംഗ് സ്റ്റാർ ഹോം സയൻസ് കോളേജിൽ വന്നിട്ടുണ്ടായ ഇംപ്രഷൻ എന്താണ് നിങ്ങൾ എല്ലാവരും കണ്ടതേ ഉള്ളുവല്ലോ ഇത്ര വേഗം ഇമ്പ്രഷൻ പറയാൻ സാധിക്കും പക്ഷേ അമ്പത്തഞ്ച് വർഷം ഒരു സ്ഥാപനം ഇരിക്കുമ്പോൾ അതിൻ്റെ അർത്ഥം ഈ സ്ഥാപനത്തിൻ്റെ ഉപയോഗം എല്ലാവർക്കും മനസ്സിലാക്കിയതാണ് അമ്പത്തഞ്ച് വർഷം ഒരു ചെറിയ കാര്യക്കാര്യമല്ല കേട്ടോ നിങ്ങളുടെ സുവർണ്ണ ജൂബിലി കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ട് അഞ്ച് വർഷം കൂടി നിങ്ങൾ മുന്നോട്ട് പോകുന്നു ഇനിയും വർഷങ്ങൾ വരും പക്ഷേ നിങ്ങൾക്കറിയണം ഈ കോളേജ് പഠിപ്പിക്കുന്നത് കുട്ടികൾക്ക് യൂസ്ഫുൾ അല്ല എന്ന് തോന്നിയിട്ടുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അച്ഛനും അമ്മമാരെയും കുട്ടികളെ ഇവിടെ അയച്ചിട്ടുണ്ടാവില്ല അപ്പോൾ അതാണ് കോളേജിൻ്റെ എഫക്റ്റീവ്നെസ്സിൻ്റെയും വിജയത്തിൻ്റെയും ഒരു അടയാളം ഒരു തെളിവ് സോ ഐ എം ഷുവർ ഇറ്റ്സ് എ ഗുഡ് കോളേജ് നിങ്ങളൊക്കെ ഇവിടെ ഉണ്ട് വെരി സ്മാർട്ട് ചിൽഡ്രൻ ഐ എം ഷുവർ ദാറ്റ് ബൈ ദ ടൈം വി ഫിനിഷ് അവർ ഇൻ്ററാക്ഷൻ ഐ വിൽ ഹാവ് എൻ ഈവൻ മോർ പോസിറ്റീവ് ഇംപ്രഷൻ ഓഫ് ദ കോളേജ് താങ്ക് യു സർ താങ്ക് യു സോ മച്ച് the next person friendly ki vannal irku elupa ah seri right good morning sir my name is aditya saji your I'm name is aditya saji hi i am from second b a english my question is is that your exposure and experience of learning outside the india that module you the extent well i'll tell you it, it's very different largely because i'm a product of a much older generation i'm probably older than your parents and in my time our style of education was different i went to america so it was different from america in two important re respects one thing is when america was doing a lot of uh computer graded papers already that is the question would be give you giving you a series of optional answers where you tick a box or you shade a box you know they, they will ask you such and such question answer a b or c you tick it and therefore the teachers don't have to read the thing it gets corrected by a computer that was how the americans used to be educated whereas in india we had used to we were used to writing long essay answers So in my days when we took examinations you had to be able to write fast write full and write clearly and that was the strength of your academic excellence i happened to be one of those irritating kids who came first in every exam but the reason was also that i was good at writing good detailed essay type answers now when i got to america it was to what they call graduate school that is the masters level and at the masters level these ticking box answers no longer work 
at master's level, you have to turn in what the Americans call term papers, which are lengthy essays. So I had a great advantage over my American classmates because I had been writing essays in India. And for me, writing a term paper was writing a longer essay answer. That's all it was. Whereas for these American kids, it was a real struggle and a slog. And therefore, I got some outstanding grades in America, and that made it much easier. That was one thing. The second thing I will say is that in some respects, India was better than what the preparation the American kids had had. First of all, in the schools I went to, and I went to two Jesuit schools and an Anglican college, so I had a Christian education throughout, as you girls are also having here. And what was interesting was that in these schools, in addition to classwork, there was a lot of emphasis on extracurricular activities. We had elocution contests, debates, speech contests, quiz contests, theater. So there were a lot of activities that gave us a chance to develop our creative side as well as sharpen skills that are useful. Speaking is a useful skill in any profession. So if you're at school itself, you have learned to speak, to debate, to argue, you can use that capacity in whatever job you do in life. Even if you don't do a job in life, it is useful to be able to speak, to persuade people. Even if you're only arguing with your parents or with your children, speaking clearly and cogently is very important. So that was a big strength we had in the schools. I had. I'm told that today, it's less common in India, but in those days it was very common, and all of us went through all of this. So I had sharpened certain skills, whereas in many American schools, this depended very much on the initiative of the individual parents, because the activities were outside the school. And so if you wanted to play football, you found you created a local team or you joined a local team. If you wanted to uh, uh, enter a spelling bee, which is a very American thing, those were competitions run from outside. Uh, if you wanted to um, uh, participate in debates, the school did very little to prepare you. You had to prepare in your own capacity and enter competitions organized outside. So America was in that sense different, and I think there India was better. And one more area that India was better was probably when it came to our capacity for memory. Already by then, I reached America in 1975. Already by then, Americans were so used to um, relying on, 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 on a printed material, photocopies were easily available. In India, photocopier was unknown in those days. In India, we were taught to memorize things. If you had to uh, study Shakespeare, you just learned whole passages. You studied English poetry or English literature. People knew a whole lot and could, 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 could quote lines and, and verses from memory. No American student could do that. Similarly, calculations. Mathematics, we were all drilled in with mathematical calculations so we could do calculations in our head. Whereas the American kids from a very young age had learned how to use a calculator. So they could not do the most simple multiplication and division that we could do. If they go to a grocery shop, they would just have to trust the cashier because the cashier had a machine that added up the bill. Whereas the Indians in America would already know while they were shopping what they had spent because they were adding it up in their heads. So these were the kinds of differences. But I would say every country has its own system that is natural for that country. Whether you go abroad to study or whether you stay here, I hope that you will sharpen the skills that you need and you will focus on what you've been taught and been taught well. Okay? Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. My name is Reshma Santosh. I'm a third become student. Hi. Sir, so as a brain drain that's keep, that keeps happening in, uh, in this state, Kerala is soon to be an uh, old age home. Sir, so my question is, is this happening because the country lacks proper job opportunities for the young youth of the country? Or is it because we fail to recognize the job opportunities that is provided to us? Or is it because that we, we no longer feel or have a, a, possess a feel towards our country? Excellent question, Reshma. In fact, this is something I said yesterday. Thank you, sir. I said exactly these words yesterday in a speech um, in Changanasheri, sorry, in, in Changanasheri and in Pala, in two speeches I had addressed this question. It worries me, Reshma, that we've got a, a situation in Kerala where so many young people feel no hope here, and those with drive and initiative 
are trying to leave our states and go to other states who go to other countries. And I think that's somewhat unfortunate to my mind for Kerala. As it is, we have fewer young people than the average in India. In India today, 51% of the population is under 25. 51%. So if you're thinking of yourself as Indians, you are the majority. People like me in the front row here are the minority. The majority are people under 25. But if you're thinking of Kerala, only 23% of our population is under 25. We are indeed disproportionately older. People are having fewer children, and many of the young are leaving the state after high school or after college, with the result that we don't have enough young people here. And of the young people who are here in Kerala, we have a 40% youth unemployment rate. The unemployment rate for those from 19 to 25 in Kerala is 40% which is more than double the figure for the rest of India. So there is a genuine problem. As you said, there are not enough opportunities here in Kerala because we don't have enough industry. We don't have enough opportunities in technology, in business, in all the areas in which young, educated people want to work. What is striking is whereas unemployment is high in the rest of India, it is high mainly among the uneducated and unskilled. Whereas in Kerala, almost everybody is educated or skilled or both, and they're the ones who are unemployed. So it's a shocking situation, and we need to change that. One of my themes in, in my political life is to say we must transform Kerala, change our lack of ease in doing business, allow people to come in and start businesses here, get the bureaucracy out of over-regulation of business, try to encourage the creation of more enterprises, more jobs, and more progress in the state. Only then will young people, maybe not yet you, but in the few years' time, I hope, will be able to find more opportunities to live and work in our state. It's essential that we do that. Thank you for pointing it out. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? Yes? Good afternoon, sir. I'm Adra from First Year BCom. Uh, my question is, though our constitution gives equality for both men and women, right. we have been witnessing inequality in our society. How we can educate our younger, younger generation to this note? Very good point. I think equality is extremely important. <laughs> equality is extremely important. As you said, it's a constitutional provision. It's a constitutional right for everyone to be treated equally. But it must start at home and it must start at a very young age. I genuinely believe that what we need to do is to inculcate these ideas of equality in small children from grade one onwards, first standard onwards. And in the homes, we must teach our parents to begin with that they must show that in their behavior. I'm sorry to say that in so many Indian homes, we still serve the boy first and then serve the girls. True? Maybe not in your home, you have a progressive parents, but others, that still is happening. There are too many situations where if a family is so poor they can only afford to educate one person, they will educate the boy even though the girl is brighter or more talented academically. All of these things are wrong. We must skew that, that whole idea and show that girls are as valuable as boys to every family. And you can only do that by teaching some of these principles from a very young age. Teaching boys to respect girls must start by age five or six. Because otherwise, when they're small, they don't understand the difference. When they get to an age where they can be influenced by other people's attitudes, that's when the social attitudes come in and create certain unfortunate assumptions on the part of boys, which I believe boys must be taught to overcome. So let's start young and let's teach them right. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. My name is Nesna Malmarikya. Hi. Nesna from First MSC. I think you pressed a button. You were fine when you mentioned your name and then the sound went. Thank <laughs> My name is Nesna Malmarikya from First Embassy Home Science. Okay. My question is that how can we develop our education system to the world standard level? Well, you know, the, that's probably 
a difficult thing to establish because what is the world standard? Every country is different and every country has evolved its own culture, its own distinctions in the field of education. Um, in the English speaking world, there will be people who will tell you that the best place you can go would be Oxford or Cambridge for a British style education. Others will tell you that America is where there is greatest freedom of choice, where the campus life is so interesting, where opportunities are so different. So you must learn about these places and decide for yourself what you think or for your family is what appeals to you. My own honest feeling is that it depends very much on your inclination. Are you more academically inclined? Are you trying to earn, learn certain, for example, if you were studying business studies, I would say go to America. If you were studying sort of politics and philosophy, I would say go to England. If you're studying um, uh, technology, possibly if you're willing to learn another language, you should try Germany, as well as, of course, uh, California in America has some cutting edge work in IT and that kind of field. It all depends on what your interests are. That's why I don't recommend that people go very young. I think they should at least do their first degree and then decide if they want to study in foreign countries and also decide what interests them and what they want to get out of it. There's a lot more freedom in Western campuses, much less freedom, say, in China or Russia, and Eastern side. But in some subjects, they're both pretty good and they're also more affordable. So if your parents have to look at budgetary issues, they may say it's easier to send you to Russia or to China than to send you to America because America may be 10 times more expensive. So all of these factors have to be borne in mind. Our educational standards must be Indian. And they must be linked to the Indian realities and the Indian marketplace. But I do believe we can aspire for excellence in our own fields. And to create a quality of education so good that foreign students want to come to India. You know, when I was young, it was quite common for African children, pretty much of all African countries, to look to come to India to study. Same with the Gulf countries. If you go and meet a certain group of people who today would be in their 70s or late 60s in Dubai, in Kuwait, in Oman, in the Gulf countries, they all had their studies in India because there were no universities in the Gulf in those days. And they thought that India was the best place to study. And many of them acquired certain habits and tastes from India and they still speak fondly of India. But once they got their prosperity through oil, money and so on, the next generation from Dubai, Kuwait, Oman and so on, they went west, not east. They didn't come to India. So I want to create an India where people will once again desire to come to India because our education is good, affordable, the culture is attractive, the campuses are friendly. To do that, we have a long way to go. And I hope we will. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Devga TS, second year BCom. So my question is, even though there are a large number of students who are at higher education institutions in India, only few people are prepared to for their employment in future or to start their own business. Sir, in your opinion, do you think that the uh, Indian education, Indian higher education, system is making us capable to prepare us for the future to secure jobs or to start our own business. You know, there was a bit of sound interference with your mic, so I'm not sure I fully heard it. You seem to be asking about linking education to employment possibilities, is that it? Uh, yeah. uh, my question is that if, if our um, uh, <coughs> higher education system is preparing us to uh, face our uh, future for uh, helping us to secure jobs or for yeah. to start our own business. So there are a couple of ideas which in fact uh, are included in my UDF manifesto last year as well. One idea is that already, in fact it came to me from a student, a student at St. Teresa's College in Kochi suggested to me, why can't we do internships while we are still studying? And I thought that was an excellent idea so I put it in the manifesto. We could create a system where while you are still in college, two or three hours a day you could work for a company the company would give you a very token remuneration because you're only working two, three hours a day. But two good things would happen. One is you would learn some exposure to how a company is working in the real world. And two, they would gain relatively qualified 
educated minds for a very modest amount of money. So it's a win-win for both sides. At the end of your period of education, you would have then a choice to make. You could either go ahead and say, I enjoyed this experience, I'll go and join this company. And the company could say, we know this girl, we want to hire her. So it becomes very easy for both of you. Or you could say, I don't like this profession at all. I want to go and do something else. So you've learned something that you would not have known had you gone for the job after graduating. So you see the advantage is very much there. The um, second possibility, which we, we need to uh, insist upon, is to have more connections between universities and the workplace. And that should be linked to ongoing work. I'm sorry to say that when I went, when I remember when Madhrabhumi set up their television station for the first time, I was invited to inspect the premises and so on. And I met a couple of uh, kids for whom it was their first job in the production room. And I said, uh, so what did you study? And they said, sir, we did a diploma in television at the Institute of Mass Communication. Well, I said, very good. So all this equipment must be familiar to you. They said, no, sir, the equipment that they had was about 20 years out of date when they were teaching us. We had to learn everything anew when we came to Madhra Mumik and they have the brand new latest equipment. So that won't do. One needs to have a real connection with real world companies. So what I want to create is a situation. When I was minister in Delhi, we created a rule that no one will be allowed to open a polytechnic in India unless there is an industry within a 30 kilometer radius of the polytechnic with which they can establish a connection. Similarly, we should have an arrangement that universities should be encouraged to establish a connection to real workplaces and those companies should in turn be able to relate to the universities. It's quite common in the West. In the West, for example, you'll find at the graduate level, very often a company will come to a university and say, um, look, we have this idea. Do you have the students who can research this? Tell us if it might work, if it's feasible, the economics of it or the science of it, whatever. If we then discover they've come up with something that we can manufacture, we will give you money and we will also give you a share of the royalties from selling this product in the marketplace. So the university gains, the students gain, and the company gains. And even if the product doesn't work out, the students have gained experience as well. That kind of thing is very common in America. It never happens in India. We need to do much more of that. I think I can only take one last question, sister. We've already taken more than 20 minutes. One last question. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Myself, Anagar Sabu. I'm a second year BSc Zoology student and an executive member of the College Union. You're a second year student of which subject? BSc Zoology, sir. Zoology, wow, okay. Sir, you are the Lurmara, Rashatilana, Agalunur tendency, Ganakina, Sajatilana, number Pacadam of Kondi Kinada. Adinakarnam, Rasha Nedakan Maridum, Rasha Nedatunola, Avishwasa Maikam. About Sara Pushakama and Elbada Lurkunar Victiana. So, my question is, what will be the future of Indian politics? Are you how the value of Jodi Manaja? What will be the future of Indian politics? Nyambareta, I think it will partially depend on all of you, this generation as you're growing up. What will you demand from the politicians? As you come in a more educated, more conscious population, aware of your rights, knowing that politicians have to be accountable to you, you should start demanding better performance. We are still looking too much in India at the politics of identity. Jadi, Madam, Bhasha, Vishwasam, Pravarti, Ideology, Idoka Kaunja Samsarikana, Ningalda Pam Avindu Chaidu, the Kanchi Chundi Kanakanula Karibula Rashtri Kaira Churing. I'm proud to say I was the first MP as late as 2009-10 to issue a report to the voters on what I had done during the year for them, how I had spent my MP funds, an annual report, which I continue doing. Now, few other MPs followed my example, but most do not. And I'm sorry to say the voters, as an experiment, for example, I stopped doing that. 
thinking, let me see if the voters say, we miss your report, where is your report? Not one complaint came, no one asked for it. And I thought, and my staff said, why do you make us do all this work of collecting all this data of all we have done during the year if no one is demanding it? So there I would turn the finger back to the voters and say, Ningal do throughout the Mandal, Ningal demandiana. Accountability in the Varnale, there are two ends to it. The politician must be accountable, but the voter must demand accountability. So if you demand more from your politicians, you will get a better politics in India in the future. I'm going to stop there. I'm glad she asked that question because once in a while I've gone to see young female students and some girl has stood up and said, we're not interested in politics. And that my answer to them is very simple. Sorry if you're not interested in politics because politics is interested in you. Politicians are taking decisions that affect your lives every day. And every decision you, that, that you have to make in life, what are the possibilities, what are the courses available, what are the jobs available, what kind of economy are you growing up in, is your country at war or at peace, all of these things are decided by politicians. So if you don't decide, you don't care about politics, you're not interested, they will still take the decisions, you will be disconnected from them, but your lives will be affected. So I'm telling you all, please be interested in politics and political outcomes just as much as you're interested in your outcomes of your life as students because at the end of the day, politics does determine, limit and influence the choices available to you. Sir, question, sir. Sir, Justice Sunanda Bandaranaya Memorial Professional. Sir, not a choice, choice, the tender details, Matrani and Abshap. Sir, not a Navada choice. Givita till we victigate Yan Gari in the Eton, Allah Gari on the Yosu. Other than Sar Paranja Marbudi, Pengutile Padipiki and Nola. Other than that on the E. College in the Sahara, the Lunuci the Air Channel. Right. Pandranda Varsham, Padimun Varsham, Mumble Prasagona. Pashe, the facts still remain true. Educate girls. I care as a Sabi the Provartikim Bowl. Oro audience in the Provartian Chimbol, Chelapo Alcar Chokim. End down a single best initiative. Keller and Villakim remove poverty, a lingal clean drinking water, a lingal Vikas in the Kuchival and Barin Villakim. Other than Parni Orchim, a course of war or education, Yamaru would a simple answer later on Parete. Educate girls. In the other than the because there are studies establishing that the single most important, most influential factor in development is educated girls and educated women. A girl with just five years of school education is immediately more productive even if she doesn't do a job. If she's just working in a farm, a family farm, or if she's just bringing up her own children, because she's educated, she understands things much more. Child mortality goes down when mothers learn the importance of boiling water, of drinking clean uh, water and milk, of cooking food for their children, of the importance of nourishment. An educated woman is also an empowered woman. She will usually be prepared to marry later and not be pressed by the family into an early marriage. She will want to space out her children so that she doesn't have more children than she can afford to look after properly and bring up properly and educate. In all these ways, educated women make a difference. And there have been study after study by university after university that have proven that the single most important factor in improving a country's GDP is in fact the education of girls. If girls are educated, the country's GDP grows faster. So I'm just telling you all, your education is also a a service to society and to the country. But you must not only be educated yourselves, you must ensure that the benefits of education are passed on to the, to the younger ones. And frankly, I have seen, I mean, I remember when I was minister, meeting a lady in Tamil Nadu who had learned the alphabet for the first time in her 60s. And she very proudly wrote her name for me. It was Chitra, I remember. And so it showed me she could write her name. I said, very good, but how has this reading and writing helped you in your life? And she said, this is a very simple. I, I go to the, uh, you know, she, she was an agricultural laborer or a handicraft maker or something. She had to go to the market in Kanjivaram. And she said, to go to Kanjivaram, I have to go to the nearest town, to the bus stop, 
and now I can read the names of the towns on the bus when the bus comes. I know how to get onto the right bus without asking people. When I get off, I can read the name of the street. She says, this is transformative for my life. It's a very simple example, but this is a woman who, when she was in class two, her parents pulled her out of school saying, what is the point of educating a girl? We'll educate only the boy. Now, fortunately, fewer parents are saying that, first of all, because of the Right to Education Act. Secondly, because of midday meals, people are thinking if you send your children to school, at least they'll get some free food. So all of these things are happening. But in the, her days, when she was young, she was taken out of school by her parents. So to be able to acquire this much of literacy, that she can figure out where she is going, understand where she is, and so on, this became a big blessing for her, a big bonus for her. So even for the very poor, very ordinary person in India, being an educated woman is being an empowered woman. And that is so much more true for all of you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir, for your valuable words. And thank you, dear students, for your active participation in the interaction. Now, I request our principal to hand over a token of gratitude to Dr. Shashi Tharoor on behalf of the entire Morningstar family and Dr. Shashi Tharoor to receive the same. Thank you, sir, and thank you, sister. Now, I invite Dr. Jinsi P. Kuriakos to deliver the word of thanks. Good afternoon, honorable member of parliament and resource person of the day, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, respected principal, Dr. Sister Rosalie Evi, Assistant Professor Ms. Sophia James, dignitaries, well-wishers, colleagues, and dear students. Morningstar Home Science College is privileged today to have Dr. Shashi Tharoor amidst us in our Emerald Jubilee year. Sir, we all eagerly listen to you on television and different social media platforms. Keenly heeded to the writer you are, the vast knowledge you possess in all fields, amazed by the way you present yourself with grace and poise. In all contexts, be it a debate, a panel discussion, an interview, a press meet, or uh, even answering to a criticism. We all look up to you, sir, as a role model and aspire to be an intellectual and scholar like you. We are also proud of the fact that you are one of us, a Malayali with an English accent. Higher education. Higher education sector of our nation is obviously facing an unprecedented crisis. The migration of our youth to Western countries for higher education immediately after their schooling, dreaming a permanent residency there, which has resulted in huge enrollment declines in the higher education institutions of India. Parents and children of our nation are apprehensive about the prospects and possibilities of higher education in India. And sessions like these will bring in some clarity on how to perceive and solve this problem. Sir, it was an honor listening to you on the topic higher education in India, prospects and possibilities. Your valuable insights on the topic and the interaction have truly inspired us and helped us in understanding the possible solutions and our responsibilities towards it. I, on behalf of the entire Morningstar family, extend a heartfelt gratitude to Honorable Member of Parliament, Speaker of the Day, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, for accepting our invitation and for being here with us today. For us, this is a historic visit to be cherished by all of us for a lifetime. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Our principal, Dr. Sister Rosalie Evi, is our pillar of support and constant source of guidance. Her vision and efforts in making this institution to scale greater heights are remarkable. Thank you, Sister, for facilitating us with this opportunity to listen to Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Thank you so much. 
I thank the internal quality assessment cell coordinator Ms. Shiny K. Tiachin and joint coordinator Ms. Sophia James for organizing this event within the limits of a short notice. Thank you, Shiny ma'am and Sophia ma'am. I humbly extend our gratitude to Mr. Jason Panikulangara for his support and help in making this event possible. Thank you, sir. I thank our PTA Vice President Advocate PJ George for his persistent support and for taking time to attend this program. Thank you, sir. I thank all the well-wishers and media persons for your presence here. I extend my sincere thanks to all wonderful colleagues of mine, teaching and non-teaching staff, for the efforts you have taken for the smooth conduct of this program. Thank you, dear colleagues. Finally, let me thank our dear students for their patient listening and active participation in the program. Thank you, dear students. Once again, thank you one and all. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Now we shall rise for the national anthem. Dear staff and students, uh, we have uh, time for a group photo with our honorable guest, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, uh, faculty member. Okay. So you can be ready for a photo. 